joyous greetings, my fellow humans, and welcome to ASM Murder, the only true crime podcast with an ASMR twist. Today's episode is number nine, and today's topic is a woman who you might know if you're from America. I first stumbled upon this murder while doing research on what murder to cover in this series. I saw that she was a painter, and I thought, meh. Then I saw something about John Kennedy, and I thought, well, if there's a Kennedy involved. But boy, oh boy, did I get so much more than I bargained for. Her murder happened almost one year after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. She was Mary Eno Pinchot Meyer, better known as Mary Meyer. Of course, you might not know her by name alone, but maybe this can help. Kennedy and her had an affair. Juicy, juicy. Thanks to her relationship with the president, her death, and of course the affair itself, was the subject of multiple books, newspaper articles, and even an entire biography. It was quite a popular case, and today we'll dive into what happened to this painter on October 12th, 1964. Content warning. This episode contains graphic content not suitable for some audiences, which include descriptions of a dead body and crime scene, mentions of sexual assault and cheating. Listener discretion is therefore advised. Mary was born into a wealthy family with multiple political connections, being the eldest daughter of Amos Pinchot, who was an important lawyer and key figure in the Progressive Party. She was also the niece of Gifford Pinchot, a conservationist who was the governor of Pennsylvania two times. Thanks to this, Mary had connections with left-wing individuals from a young age and ended up interested in communism when she attended Vassar College. She met John F. Kennedy at a dance held in Choate in 1935, one that she had attended with William Atwood, her boyfriend at the time. After she graduated from college in 1942, she became a journalist and worked for Mademoiselle in United Press and was under scrutiny by the Federal Bureau of Investigation because she was part of the American Labor Party. She got married to Cord Meyer on April 19, 1945. He was a lieutenant of the Marine Corps who lost an eye in combat, and both of them shared similar views and beliefs in world government, which made them get attached to each other very quickly. After all, they had met just a year before their engagement. They had three children, and the little family moved to Washington, D.C. as Cord was hired by the CIA. But it wasn't all that simple. In 1953, Senator Joseph McCarthy publicly accused the ex-lieutenant of being a communist. We have to keep in mind that the Cold War ended in this exact year, and being a communist meant being on the Soviet side. It was like betraying the USA back then. As the Federal Bureau of Investigation had looked into Mary's political past, finding that she had an interest in communism and so backing up McCarthy's claim. Even if Cord himself wasn't a communist, he was accused of being so because of his wife's past political preferences. By early 1954, he was unhappy with his job at the CIA and tried to find a different occupation, with no luck. In the summer of that same year, John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jackie Kennedy, bought the house next door to the Myers, who were now living in McLean, Virginia. Mary and Jackie soon became close friends. Cord and Mary got divorced in 1958, two years after their middle child, Michael, was hit by a car and died. Mary moved to Georgetown with her two surviving sons, and her relationship with John F. Kennedy soon became sexual after October 1961. Two years later, the president wrote her a letter imploring her to join him for a private romantic meeting, but he was never able to send it. He wrote, Why don't you leave suburbia for once? Come and see me, either here or at the Cape next week or in Boston on the 19th. I know it is unwise, irrational, and that you may hate it. On the other hand, you may not and I will love it. You say that it is good for me not to get what I want? After all of these years, you should give me a more loving answer than that. Why don't you just say yes? And the signature simply had one letter. J. It's highly possible that Mary's relationship with JFK was the motive behind her murder. We'll now talk about her death and the investigation of it. October 12th, 1964. It was a calm autumn day just like any other. Mary had just finished a painting and decided to go for her daily walk along the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal towpath in Georgetown. Shortly after, mechanic Henry Wiggins heard a woman screaming for help, soon followed by two gunshots. 
He ran to a low wall looking upon the path where he saw the culprit standing over the body of a white woman, who was described as a black man in a light jacket, dark slacks, and a dark cap. It was Mary. Her body had two bullet wounds, one in her back and one in her temple, and a forensics expert from the FBI said that she had dark halos on the skin on both injuries, which indicated that she had been shot at close range, possibly point-blank range. The precision and lethality of the shots made the District of Columbia Medical Examiner think that the culprit was very experienced in the use of firearms. About 40 minutes after the crime happened, Washington, D.C. police detective John Warner saw an African-American man called Ray Crump who was walking while being soaking wet about a quarter of a mile away from the crime scene, or so the detective said at the murder trial. Crump said he had been fishing, dropped his pole, and fell into the canal while trying to retrieve it. But he was still arrested at 115 as the mechanic Wiggins told the police that he was the man who he saw standing over the victim's body. The following day, another witness, William L. Mitchell, testified that he had seen a black man following a white woman who he believed was Mary. As the description of the stranger's clothing was similar to what Crump wore that day, and two witnesses stated that they had seen a similar person, Crump was charged for murder without a preliminary hearing. Although nobody ever found a gun, and Crump was never linked to a gun of the type used for the crime. The FBI crime report documented that there was no forensic evidence linking this man to the murder or even the crime scene, as Crump had no traces of Mary's blood on his body or clothes. If he had been the real culprit, he would have had at least some drops on him, as Mary had blood in large amounts from her head wound. Shortly after Mary's brother-in-law, Ben Bradley, finished his lunch, CIA official Wistar Janey called him. Police hadn't identified the body yet, yet Janie phoned him after hearing a news report on the radio about the murder of a woman at the towpath. Even if there was no name being said, he managed to link the crime to Bradley. Mary had no items with her name on them at the moment of the crime, so it was very strange that the CIA official called her brother-in-law if they didn't know her identity. But it had an explanation. The description of the woman made Janie think it was Mary, according to what he said on the phone. Bradley hadn't listened to the radio before the call, and he didn't know there had been a murder. He immediately left his workplace in downtown Washington, D.C., and went to his home in Georgetown. He felt uncertainty about who could have been the victim and found multiple neighbors when he arrived home, including his friend Harry Doc Delinsky, a pharmacist. He was accompanied by Delinsky to the District of Columbia morgue, where the body was identified as Mary. Cord Myers said that immediately after Janie phoned Bradley about the radio news report, he called him and said that his ex-wife was the victim of the crime. Bradley had no suspicions about how the CIA official knew the identity of the victim when she wasn't carrying any kind of information about her identity or house. It said he had a hard time remembering some details, yet police only identified the body after 3.45 p.m. Crump came to trial in 1965, and in the courtroom, Judge Howard Corcoran said that Mary's private life couldn't be discussed there. Her background was also kept from Crump's lawyer, Dovey Johnson Roundtree, who later said she could barely find anything about the murder victim. At trial, Roundtree proved that her client was 50 pounds lighter and 5 inches shorter than the 5 foot H, 185 pound male that mechanic Wiggins had described to police. Although Lieutenant Mitchell estimated the height of the man he claimed to have seen trailing Pinchot Meyer at 5 foot 8 inches, he was not able to identify Crump as the man he had seen near the crime scene. On July 29, 1965, Crump was acquitted and the murder remains unsolved to this very day. People claim that the man's post-trial criminal records indicate that he could have been capable of murdering Mary, but his lawyer says that all of that violence came from the trauma of having been incarcerated for eight months while he awaited trial for the victim's murder. Other revelations corroborate Crump's innocence regarding Mary's murder, and there might have been another black man at the murder scene. The police dispatched a search for Crump's jacket 15 minutes before his arrest. Roundtree stated that her client had an alibi, a married woman with whom Crump had a sexual encounter with near the crime scene, but she had been too afraid of her husband to testify and ended up disappearing before her lover's trial. Bradley said that even when Crump was acquitted, police immediately escorted him to the border of the District of Columbia and Virginia and told him never to go to Columbia again even when they knew he was the father of six underage children who lived there. 
Cord left the CIA in 1977 and later wrote in his 1982 autobiography that he was satisfied with knowing that Mary had been killed in an attempt to escape from a sexual assault. He didn't believe that his former wife's death had any explanation other than this. There were multiple allegations after Mary's death involving her relationship with John F. Kennedy. In March 1976, an issue of the National Enquirer quoted James Truitt as stating that Mary had a two-year affair with the president and that they smoked marijuana in the White House. He said that Mary had told him about her relationship with the president and he kept notes regarding what she said to him. It was said that their first encounter happened after Mary was brought to the White House by a Secret Service agent where she met Kennedy and they went to a bedroom by themselves. They met each other pretty regularly, sometimes even up to three times per week. Mary and Kennedy had met about 30 times, usually when his wife was out of town, from January 1962 until the president's death in November of the following year. Truett said the two usually had drinks or dinner by themselves or with an aide, and that Mary offered cigarettes with marijuana to Kennedy after one of their meetings on April 16, 1962. After they smoked three joints, she told her lover that she would get cocaine for him. Later, Truett corrected himself and said that Kennedy was the one that gave Mary the marijuana. He said the Nashville Enquirer had paid him but never said how much. Truett's allegations were denied by Kennedy aides Kenneth O'Donnell and Timothy Reardon Jr., and Powers was unavailable for comment. Mary's sister, Tony, stated that the Enquirer had quoted her out of context to make it look like she agreed with Truett's allegations. The Washington Post, Associated Press, and United Press International printed a follow-up story that cited assertions by Truett's physician and his former wife that his judgment was impaired by mental illness. However, Truett's allegations regarding Mary's affair with Kennedy and existence of a diary in which she recorded the affair were confirmed in 1995. Her sister was the one to confirm the existence of both the affair and the diary. Tony had found it in her sibling's studio and after her death turned it over to James Jesus Angleton, who later burned it at CIA headquarters. Ben Bradley states in his 1995 account that he and his wife received an international phone call on the night of the murder from Mary's friend Anne Truett in Japan, who was looking for James Jesus Angleton at the Bradley house. Truett advised all of them, including Angleton, of the existence of Mary's diary and the urgent need to retrieve it because all the details about Mary's affair with Kennedy during the last two years of his life. Bradley, Tony, James Angleton, and his wife Cicely, and another friend found present at the scene made a decision to keep the diary's existence from authorities. According to Bradley's account, the search at Mary's art studio behind his house began the day after the crime. He says he and his wife arrived at the studio with tools to enter because they had no key, and when they arrived they found Angleton in the process of picking the lock with special tools. It was strange seeing the CIA's counterintelligence chief trying to break in, but Bradley didn't suspect much from that. But this account conflicted with testimony Bradley gave in 1965 at Crump's trial, in which he had been asked by the prosecutor if he had made any effort to enter his sister-in-law's art studio on the evening of the crime. Bradley exclaimed that he had managed to enter without a problem, and that all that was found in the art studio was a pocketbook with keys, cosmetics, pencils, and a wallet without mentioning the diary even once. After learning years later about the existence, contents, and destruction of the diary, Prosecutor Alfred Hantman and Defense Attorney Dovey Johnson Roundtree, as well as D.C. Police Detective Bernie Crook, said that knowing that information when the trial happened would have been effective at the proceedings. In 1983, former Harvard University psychology lecturer Timothy Leary claimed to have met Mary several times. According to him, she went to see him because she was interested in learning how to give LSD sessions. They used psilocybin together, and she warned him about powerful men in Washington who wanted to use the drugs for warfare and espionage and for brainwashing, while she and a group of women wanted to use the drugs for peace and nothing else by holding LSD sessions with powerful Washington figures to enlighten them. Larry wrote that Mary became afraid after a woman she had recruited for her plan had informed people in power about the strategy, and Mary said that both Leary and her were in danger. He said that soon after Kennedy's assassination, Mary called him and was sobbing, and she said, quote, they couldn't control him anymore. He was changing too fast. They covered everything up, end quote. 
After the 1976 publication of the National Enquirer article on James Truett's claims, Leary realized Mary had been describing her affair and drug use with President Kennedy. He makes this claim in his 1983 memoir. There was no actual evidence that indicated that Mary and Kennedy had taken LSD, but it is true that the timing of the woman's visit to Leary coincided with her private meetings with the president. This case inspired many memoirs, novels, and even a TV series, as everything regarding this case is still a mystery and there's no more suspects yet. Mary's connection with JFK might have been what caused her death, but nothing is known for sure even over 40 years later. Some people think that the CIA was behind her death, as she died a few weeks after the release of the Warren Commission, which concluded that Kennedy's assassination was committed by a lone gunman. She allegedly challenged these conclusions, and this theory was fueled by this, combined with the fact that Mary's phone was wiretapped, plus the CIA's counterintelligence chief had to break into her studio. It said she died because she knew too much. Well, alas, fellow humans, we have come to an end of yet another episode, but boy, howdy, do I love a good conspiracy theory. It's the kind of thing that makes me want to glance over my shoulder. What is it about conspiracies that surround JFK and keeps us coming back over and over? Is it that we just want there to be something sordid or wrong? Or does part of us realize deep down that some of the stories that should make sense don't, and the ones that don't make sense do? As usual, I just want to say that it was a privilege and a pleasure to spend time with you today. That was episode 9 of ASM Murder, and I have been your friendly neighborhood crew. If you want to catch up on any episodes you missed, or if you want to hear more of me in general, you can go to my website at murderpod.net. That's M-U-R-D-E-R-P-O-D.net. I'll leave a link in the description. You can also find my podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. If you enjoyed what you heard, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, be kind to yourselves, be good to each other. Take care.